Hello and welcome to the Zoom interview series. I have a very exciting guest today and his name is Donald Robertson. Donald, would you like to tell our audience a little bit about yourself today? Hi Jodie. Yeah, well first of all it's my pleasure to be here as your guest uh, speaking to your audience and I'm looking forward to our chat. Um, so I'm a cognitive behavioural psychotherapist. I was born in Scotland. I lived in England. I emigrated to Canada and now I'm in Greece. I'm speaking to you from Athens today and I'm a writer. I've written six books on philosophy and psychotherapy and I'm mainly known for writing and teaching stuff about Stoic philosophy and how it relates to cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, modern psychotherapy. And my last book was How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. It was about the life and philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. And the thing I'm working on at the moment is a graphic novel. It's a bit of a kind of step in a new direction for me, but I'm bang in the middle of doing that. So I've been working on that today before I, I got on the call with you. Wow, that's incredible. And, you know, some of the audience might not know what stoicism is. So, you know, for someone that doesn't really know about it, could you yeah. explain to us what it is, where it came from, and how it can help us um, in yeah. today's challenging times? Well, who are these men in the sandals that we keep talking about? Who are these guys, stoic philosopher dudes? Um, so the, I guess there's three questions there, like, you know, who are the Stoics? Well, Stoicism is a Greek philosophy. It was founded in Athens, where I am, in 301 BC by a guy called Zeno of Citium. And Stoicism flourished for about 500 years. And the last famous Stoic was Marcus Aurelius, who's a Roman emperor. People might know him from the movie Gladiator. He's played by Richard Harris in the first act of the movie Gladiator, if we can remember that far back. With Russell Crowe. And the, the other famous Stoics whose writings survived today were also from the Roman imperial period. And they are Seneca and Epictetus, who people may have come across as well. And another name they might have heard is Cicero. He's the most famous orator of ancient Rome. And Cicero wasn't a Stoic, but he wrote about the Stoics. He liked the Stoics. And he's one of our main sources for information about their philosophy. So that's kind of quick potted history of who the guys in the togas and sandals are actually are. And then what did they believe? Well, Stoicism is a branch of Socratic philosophy. So Socrates came a generation before Zeno, and uh, the Stoics were very influenced by Socrates, so they draw on his philosophy. And in particular, the idea that uh, external things, uh, the things that most people pursue in life, health, wealth, reputation, stuff like that, these things aren't intrinsically good the Stoics and Socrates said, like uh, they only become good in the hands of somebody who knows how to use them well. Um, so wealth in the hands of a vicious tyrant would be a bad thing. It would allow them to do more vicious, tyrannical things. But in the hands of a wise and benevolent ruler, then wealth might help them to do more wise and benevolent things. So the Socrates and the Stoics said, look, people have got it back to front. They're chasing after these things that are really a means to an end. The really important thing in life is having the wisdom to know how to use things well. And they call that wisdom arate, which we also translate as virtue. And so the Stoics believe that virtue is the only truly good thing. And all these other things in life are relatively indifferent. So it's a moral philosophy. It's what we call a virtue ethic name that we use for this type of philosophy. And there is a glaringly obvious psychological consequence to this fundamental ethical worldview that they have. And that is that if someone really believed that other people's opinions of them, reputation, wealth, property, these sort of things that are never entirely under our control. If someone believed that those things weren't the be all and end all, that they're relatively indifferent, they had a take it or leave it attitude towards them. And that the, the most important thing was their own strength of character. As a consequence, if you imagine that person, they, they'd probably be more psychologically resilient. They'd be more able to cope with uh, loss and deprivation, misfortune and setbacks in life because of the moral beliefs that they identify with, where they would make them psychologically resilient. So the Stoics were known for also having a, philosoph a, a philosophical therapy 
and a way of training themselves in psychological and emotional resilience. And so they're very important today because cognitive behavioral therapy, the leading modern evidence-based type of psychotherapy is inspired by stoicism and it shares the same philosophical premise with stoicism uh, to some extent. So cognitive therapy is based on a thing called the cognitive theory of emotion, which says that our emotions are shaped by underlying beliefs. And that's very important because those beliefs can be true or false. So it means we can question the evidence for them, question whether they're coherent or rational, and that will then affect our, our feelings. It can be therapeutic to do that and opens up a whole toolbox of other cognitive techniques. The founders of cognitive therapy, in order to teach this to their clients, used a quote from Epictetus, one of the Stoic philosophers I mentioned earlier. And that quote's probably the single most famous quote from the Stoics, so it's probably worth mentioning at the outset. And it goes like this. It says, it's not things that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. And that encapsulates the cognitive theory of emotion, the theory that our emotions are based on underlying opinions or beliefs. That's what we mean by a cognition. A cognition means a thought or a belief. And so that's how ancient Stoic philosophy and modern cognitive therapy intersect, they overlap. And from that shared premise, uh, you're likely to arrive at similar conclusions anyway. So that's probably why today we're seeing a resurgence of popularity in Stoicism. It was growing since the 1950s in popularity. And then recently, this thing called the pandemic, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, has, for one reason or another, led to uh, another huge spike in popularity of Stoicism, the books by Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, the sales figures for them, according to the publishers, have shot through the roof since the beginning of the pandemic. And that's partly, I should mention, uh, to conclude my little introduction to Stoicism, that by coincidence, perhaps, two of the most famous pandemics in the ancient world uh, happened to have occurred during the lifetimes of Socrates and Marcus Aurelius. So Socrates lived through the plague of Athens and Marcus Aurelius lived through a plague that was named after him. His full name is Marcus Aurelius Antoninus and we call it the Antonine Plague after his uh, cognomen, his family name. Um, and so these philosophers, uh, their philosophy of resilience developed in part as a way of coping with uh, situations like a, a plague or a pandemic yeah oh that's that's absolutely incredible um thank you so much robert for sharing your wisdom and and inspiration and passion that you have for stoicism and what i'm hearing is stoicism could make a massive difference with how we actually react and respond to the pandemic there's and also with our emotions. If you think about it, our emotions are everything. They affect our decisions. They affect how we feel about events, situations. But most of the time, we actually have no control over it. The only thing we have control over is how we react, how we respond, and how we see the situation. Um, that, that's incredible. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that with the audience. And I really hope whoever's listening, um, yeah, has some curiosity around how stoicism can can help massively in these challenging times that we're facing. That's amazing. Um, so a question I have for you, mm -hmm. was there a defining moment that led you into stoicism? You know, um, obviously you've you've been doing it a very long time you've written some incredible books this is your life this is you you breed it was there something that happened to you for you to go down that road of becoming a, a fellow stoic yeah um well i had to write about this actually in my my last book uh, because my publisher asked me to write a little kind of biographical introduction so it made me think about it again uh, and try to pinpoint what led me into stoicism. Um, my father passed away when I was about 14 years old, and he was, uh, it's a bit of an odd story perhaps, but my, my father was a Freemason, 
And uh, my hometown, Ayr in Scotland, Freemasonry is very common. It's kind of part of the culture. So most of my friends' fathers were also Freemasons. And when my father passed away, he didn't leave many belongings behind, but he left a bunch of books on, on Freemasonry. And I flicked through them. And uh, there's a, a lot of stuff. Freemasonry is a combination of um, Christianity, and particularly a lot of stuff from the Old Testament, and uh, Hellenistic philosophy. And there are a lot of references to Pythagoras and Plato and things like the Four Cardinal Virtues, which found its way from Socratic and Platonic philosophy into Stoic philosophy. And uh, that got me reading about philosophy and religion. I read uh, a lot about Christianity and Gnostic uh, Christianity, uh, Hermeticism, uh, Greek philosophy, Neoplatonism. And then uh, it started me on a journey trying to understand all of these things. Um, and so for my father, or for my friend's fathers, Freemasonry gave them a kind of virtue ethic and a philosophy of life uh, of a sort. And so I was looking for something like that, I guess, myself. And I, I thought I might find it in academic philosophy. So I went and I studied philosophy at Aberdeen University in Scotland. And uh, I didn't quite find what I was looking for. I studied history of religion and philosophy. I learned uh, about meditation techniques and self-hypnosis and all sorts of self-improvement techniques. And uh, I studied psychotherapy. I um, read Freud and Jung and R.D. Lang and all these guys. And then after I graduated, I stumbled across the Stoics. Now, most undergraduate philosophy degrees don't cover Stoicism. In fact, it's one of the few major schools of classical philosophy that's left off the curriculum. And I, I would ask uh, academic philosophers why it wasn't covered. And they'd say, well, that's because, in their view, uh, the main concepts that the Stoics use are derived from earlier philosophers, like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. And they would say, all the Stoics do is develop the practical, psychological application of those concepts in daily life. So why would anybody want to read that, right? But that's, ironically, the very reason that everybody else is now interested in Stoicism, because they take those concepts and figure out the practical implications of putting them into practice in daily life. And because I was interested in training in psychotherapy, I realized that stoicism had inspired cognitive therapy. And so I had this revelation, I guess I was about 22 or something at the time. And uh, I realized that the stoics taught the psychological techniques I was interested in. They taught meditation techniques, contemplative practices. They provided a philosophy of life derived from Socrates. And they were also the basis to modern psychotherapy. So these three areas that I was interested in suddenly came together in one tradition. I thought, I'm only going to have to read the Stoics now. I don't have to read all these different books. Like, I can just read Seneca and I'll be good. Like, and so that was a relief for me. And that was basically how I found my way to the subject. But at that time, there were only a few academic books and a, a few kind of popular books. And it was a niche nerdy, obscure academic area. And people thought it was strange that I was interested in it. And that seems like a lifetime ago because now there are huge communities of people interested in Stoicism. There are big conferences for Stoicism and there are loads and loads of books coming out all the time about Stoicism. And that, when I was a lad, that wasn't the case. So I'm, I'm thrilled really, as excited as a Stoic can be to see that suddenly, <laughs> Stoicism is trendy. I always used to like to say to people, ancient philosophy is the future, you know, but I was kind of joking. And, but now it, it's become a, a, a really, it's a thing, as the kids say, as the young people say, stoicism has become a thing culturally. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, I think you're onto something there um, around that this could be, you know, the way of the future with, you know, living in a Western world, um, you know, dealing with pandemics, dealing with our stress and emotions of just being human in a, in a digital world where it's forever changing rapidly so fast that we can't keep up with. Um, what an incredible thing to implement in your life is uh, stoicism. 
is uh, building emotional resilience around everything that is happening. Because like I say, most things we can't control, but we can control us. That's the only thing we have left, isn't it? <laughs> yep. That's, uh, Seneca once said, uh, the greatest empire. And Seneca was the advisor, incidentally, to the Emperor Nero. He was Emperor Nero's speechwriter and his right-hand man. Um, but nevertheless, Seneca said the, the greatest empire is to be emperor of oneself. Beautifully said. I love it. What an incredible, wow, that's just blown me away. So, Robert, what advice could you give someone that is having a hard time with, you know, everything that's going on in the world right now that's suffering, you know, some anxiety and just with their own emotions? With, with all your years of wisdom and knowledge, is there something you'd like to share with the audience that would help someone sort of going through a hard time? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a difficult question to answer because <laughs> the things that help people tend to, there are hundreds of techniques in therapy and the, the things that help people vary a lot depending on the person's personality, the circumstances, the nature of the emotional problems that they're experiencing. Nevertheless, um, so ther the therapist and me would say we have to do an assessment like, and then figure out a, an individualized treatment plan for clients usually. But there is some general purpose advice that you can give people about coping with stressful situations. Um, there's no piece of advice that's going to suit everybody. Like, there are options. Like, you know, there are, in the first book I wrote on Stoicism, I identified 18 different psychological techniques that the, the Stoics recommend. So we can pick a couple of those out. The most important one, arguably, is that uh, this idea I mentioned earlier, that it's not things that upset us, but our opinions about them. And this is a tricky one to describe, but modern psychologists call the ability to really perceive that cognitive distancing. Um, and so it's a slippery concept, but we know that it's a very robust, a very powerful, a very simple concept once people grasp it. So Aaron T. Beck, the founder of Cognitive Therapy, described it to clients like this. He would say, imagine you were wearing colored glasses. You'd had them on for a long time. In fact, you've been wearing them for so long that you forgot that you're wearing them. And so you just thought, that dude over there is pink. That house is pink. That dog over there is pink. But then one day somebody knocks your glasses off and you suddenly realize that it was only the glasses that were pink and that you were looking through the pinkness at objects that had different colors, right? Of course. But the same is true of our value judgments and many of our other opinions, the cognitive therapist would say. So if somebody loses their job and they say, this is awful, it's a catastrophe, it's ruined my life then maybe they're looking at the event through catastrophic colored glasses. Um, someone else might look at it as an opportunity, for example, or they might see it as a setback, but not a total catastrophe. In fact, there might be lots of different perspectives that you could adopt and look at it. And particularly the Stoics would say in relation to our value judgments. Our value judgments, we talk about them as if they're natural properties, so if I say this is big, it's small, it's heavy, it's light, it's a catastrophe. Grammatically, it, it sounds like these are just all descriptions of simple facts that I'm observing in nature. Um, but it's a catastrophe isn't a description of a natural property. It's an expression of how I feel about it. It's a value judgment. It comes entirely from within me. Um, it doesn't describe it. In nature, there are no catastrophes. Nature just bring things together and breaks them up again. It's only we humans that think it's good or bad when it does that. There's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And so when we fuse our value judgments with external events and we say, but it just is a catastrophe. So our value judgments become identified with and blended with external events. So it feels like we're just describing what we see. That's problematic um, because it tends to mean our emotions are stronger, stickier, and it's harder for us to problem solve because it's difficult for us to look at the situation from different perspectives. And so the Stoics want us to separate our value judgments from external events. 
and to realize that we are imposing value judgments on things and that those values don't inherently exist outside of our minds. And they think, if we can just remember that, if we can remember that that guy isn't pink and the dog's not pink, but that it's just the glasses that are pink and we could put blue glasses on or we could put green glasses on if we wanted to. And then the guy would be pink and uh, green and the dog would be green and so on. As long as we can remember that and realize that the value judgments come from inside rather than outside, their effect on our emotions will be diluted and we'll have greater cognitive flexibility. We'll be more able to think about things from different perspectives and more able to problem solve. So I think that's the first tip that I would give to people, um, that they should just meditate on the meaning of that sentence. It's not things that upset us, but our, rather our opinions about them um, and learn to see their value judgments uh, and the opinions that caused their distress is something that's kind of arbitrary and subjective that they could change. That's the first tip that I would give uh, to people. We know from modern research in psychotherapy that this is one of the simplest and most beneficial strategies that people can employ. Now, another tip that happens to tie into modern research in psychology is the Stoics were always trying to broaden their perspective. So in one sense, they thought they were trying to emulate the view of God. They thought uh, wisdom would consist in having a kind of godlike view of the universe, being omniscient, like being able to see the whole picture, basically. And the Stoics were aware that poor mortal creatures that we are, you know, we only see what's under our nose and we kind of hear what's around us. We're very limited by our senses. And so we tend to blow things out of proportion because we kind of forget the context that events fit into. And when, but our intellect allows us to put things within a wider context, we, but it requires an effort. We have to think about things in, in order to look at the bigger picture. So the Stoics have many different ways of doing this, but often they'll encourage people to imagine looking down on events from high above in order to picture the wider context, both in terms of time and space. Now I mentioned just two little things about that. Number one is that modern research in psychopathology tends to show um, that normally we can think about several things. We can usually think about half a dozen things at a time. So you could be driving your car, talking to your kids in the back seat, listening to the radio and thinking about what you're going to have for dinner tonight. As I like to put it, we can, the, our brains are designed so that we can walk and chew gum, right? We can do <laughs> more than one thing at a time. We can kind of multitask. But under stress, we can't. Like it becomes harder for us when we're upset angry or distressed our scope of attention becomes narrowed and we put distressing things under a magnifying glass um, and that makes them more upsetting um, and it prevents us from noticing things in our environment that would balance out how we feel um, so we look for signs of danger when we're anxious but we ignore signs of safety like that's called threat monitoring in modern psychology and so to have a rounded and balanced a rational perspective You'd want to broaden your attention so you take in the whole picture. And the Stoics are constantly encouraging themselves to do that. They were very smart. They were 2,300 years ahead of their time, Jody. They, they realized <laughs> that narrowing your attention, like putting things under a magnifying glass, is dangerous emotionally and that we need to learn to look at a bigger picture. And the second thing I was going to say is we can do that spatially by visualizing things, for instance, um, intellectually by posing certain questions. Um, but uh, chronologically, there's a very, there are lots of techniques we use in therapy and some of them are tricky to do, but there are also techniques that modern therapists use that are really simple and that work pretty reliably. And one of them is just to ask clients what would probably happen next about feared catastrophes. So somebody might say, well, I'm worried that I might lose my job. And a therapist, if they're feeling lazy, and they want an easy uh, time in the session, for instance, they could just say, well, suppose you did lose your job, what would probably happen next? And then the client will normally say, well, I'd be really upset. I'd cry in my beer. Like, I'd, I'd, I'd just be sitting at home. I'd feel distraught. And they'd talk about how terrible it is. And then the therapist might say, and then what would probably happen next? 
And the client would say, well, I'd, I'd, I'd probably mope about at home and watch a lot of Netflix, Netflix and then maybe complain to some of my friends. And, and then the therapist can say, and then what would probably happen next? And they say, well, I guess I'd start applying for other jobs or, or maybe I'd try and get a loan to start a business. And then what would probably happen next? Well, maybe I'd, I'd get a few knockbacks or rejections, but I guess eventually maybe I'd find a job or I'd, I'd get started. And then what would probably happen next? And then by getting people to move their perspective forward in time, they're still aware of the feared outcome, but they're putting it in a broader chronological perspective. So it seems less overwhelming. And you could also say that the truth is the bigger picture. Like when we focus on the moment and ignore what comes before and after it, we're committing a kind of lie of omission. We're taking things out of context. Um, and so our emotions become intensified. But, you know, when we look at the bigger picture, our emotions become more realistic and also more complex and more nuanced because we can see good and bad in things. And so the wise person, the Stoics would say, always looks at the bigger picture. And this is another very simple, very general piece of advice I'd give to uh, people out there, um, you know, when they're facing difficult situations like a pandemic you know, loss of job, uh, you know, relationship breakups and things like that, you know, it can be difficult in the moment, but if you can train yourself to look at the bigger picture, another way of doing that is to say a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, looking back on this event, like uh, what would have changed in terms of how you, you feel about it. And if you could, the facts are the same, but you would feel differently about it looking back in five years, why shouldn't you feel the same way now that you would then? Why? Because to say the facts are the same, it's just that in the future you probably feel less upset by it. Why not feel less upset about it now then? Why? So these are all strategies that allow us to avoid two extremes. When people encounter upsetting things, they normally either focus in on them and ruminate about them, they dwell on them, Put them under a magnifying glass or they deny them and try and avoid thinking about them completely and so the trick is to do neither of those two things because they're both unhealthy so one alternative is to continue to think about the thing but to do so by placing it within a broader context so that we're neither denying it nor amplifying it but looking at it facing up to it in a way that puts it in perspective I like it. And, um, you know, obviously with the pandemic, there have been people that have lost their jobs and there is, you know, mental health has skyrocketed. So that's an incredible message for our audience um, around how we can actually deal with the situation here and now. And I like how obviously that's something that you would work with your clients around what's going to happen, what's going to happen, because it's almost like we're preparing for the worst. And if we can prepare for the worst, it gives us a sense of it's actually going to be okay. Because, yeah, that's amazing. And um, I see that you've uh, written a new book, uh, which sounds really exciting, How to Live Like a Roman Emperor. Firstly, what was behind choosing a name like that? And, and what, what is your purpose for the book? Well, um, the reason I chose the name was my publisher asked me to write an introductory book on Stoicism. And I thought, well, I've already written an introductory book on Stoicism. It's called Stoicism and the Art of Happiness. And I've written lots of articles about it. And lots of other people are writing introductory books on Stoicism. So I thought, it, there's too many of these. I want to do something different. So sometimes when people ask me to do something and I'm not really sure about it, I'll ask myself, is there a way to say yes and no to this? Is there a way to do it, but not do it? Is there a way to do it, but differently? Um, and I thought, could I write an introductory book on Stoicism, but from a different angle? Right? Uh, yes and no. Right? So I thought... One way to do that would be to write about a famous Stoic. And I thought I'd write, I could write about Zeno. He's the founder of Stoicism. Um, but we don't have enough anecdotes about him. We've got some good anecdotes about him, but not enough to fill a book. And then I thought, if only there was 
a, a famous Stoic philosopher who was like a really big deal back in the day. And there was like histories and archaeological evidence and stuff like that about them. And I thought, well, Marcus Aurelius, because he is the last famous Stoic and he was a Roman emperor at the height of Rome's power. So we have uh, his book. We have a cache of private letters that he wrote. We have at least three major Roman histories of his reign and a bunch of other textual fragments about him. We have some archaeological evidence. Even here in uh, Athens, he came here once and uh, outside Athens there's a town called Eleftsina where they initiated people into the Eleusinian mysteries and Marcus went there. There's an archway that he had constructed at the entrance that had uh, his bust in the, in the top of oh, the wow. archway. Um, so they, we have archaeological evidence that, that depicts him and also shows the stuff that he did, the fact that he was here and was initiated into this, uh, this mystery religion, which incidentally is kind of like a forerunner. The mystery religions are a forerunner of uh, Freemasonry. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll write a book about Marcus Aurelius and his, his book, the Meditations is a record of his personal thoughts. We call it The Meditations. It's one of the best-selling self-help books or spiritual classics of all time. It's one of the most widely read books of its kind. Um, but it, the title, The Meditations, is a modern title. The earliest manuscript has the title To Himself written at the top of it. So these are little instructions, uh, uh, reflections that he was addressing uh, to himself. And I thought, what does this book tell us? It tells us how to think like Marcus Aurelius, because um, these are his own instructions to himself about how he should think about things. He says, for instance, as I mentioned, we call this the view from above, what I mentioned earlier. Marcus talks about it several times, and he says to himself every day, imagine that you're suddenly traveling high up a loft and you're looking down on public assemblies where people are arguing about politics, on the law courts, uh, on people getting married, on people separating, on people trading and selling their goods. Um, and looking down, he uses the word uh, agoras, uh, marketplaces. Um, and coincidentally, here in Athens, like many ancient uh, towns, it uh, grew around a hill fort. And so there's a hill in the middle of Athens called the Acropolis. It literally means the, the high up place. And it overlooks the Athenian agora, uh, literally. So all the things that Marcus is describing there are, are, are what someone like Socrates would have seen, or perhaps Marcus when he came here, if they'd walked up to the top of the Acropolis where the temple to Athena was located and they looked down, they would have this view from above of the Agora, the, the city centre, uh, where all of the hubbub and life went about, and they would be able to see it within this, from this helicopter view, within this uh, broader perspective. So Marcus talks about this as how he's teaching himself to think. And so I thought uh, it would be a good title to, to call the book How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, How to Think About Marcus Aurelius. And it was deliberately meant to be a little bit ambiguous, because I knew then people would argue about it, and they'd say, what do you mean think like Caligula? You know, people assume that Roman emperors are all kind of corrupt and tyrannical. Uh, and the thing is that some of them were and some of them weren't, right? They were all different. So they're good emperors and they're bad emperors. And so Nero and uh, Caligula and uh, Commodus, many of the others were quite bad, quite corrupt emperors. But there were also some really good emperors. Uh, Marcus Aurelius and also his predecessor, Antoninus Pius, were famously very rational, very benevolent um, very highly regarded, virtuous uh, rulers. And uh, so this is a guide to how to think like one of the better Roman emperors. I like it. And um, I love how you've chosen a different name because people will get more curious. Because like you say, there's so many more um, people writing books about stoicism, which I believe is an incredible thing because I think it's a great way to live in the Western world is to have a stoic approach on life. Um, Mm -hmm. happiness virtue and just accepting that life isn't perfect but we we all need to soldier on and if we can grasp our own emotions in a way we can make better decisions and moving mm -hmm. forward and solve problems which is even better mm -hmm. so I've got a, one last question for you uh, just checking the time 
What do you think would happen if they introduced stoicism to education? So for our young people, for our youth, what do you think that, um, I know that's a big question, but I love asking big questions. Uh Yeah, I used to work in schools. I used to be a schools counsellor, mainly worked with 15 year olds in high schools in South London, incidentally. Um, Well, philosophy used to be mainly for young people, in a sense. Um, In ancient Athens and subsequently in Rome, um, people, it was mainly young men that studied philosophy. There's there's another whole kind of worms there about ancient cultures were quite sexist and uh, female philosophers are kind of rare. Um, So it was mainly considered to be a man's thing. But uh, if around age 15 um, was when uh, the transition to technically to, the, to adulthood legally in Greek and Roman society. And that, that was around about that age that people usually began studying philosophy. And so it, the perception was that it was older men um, who would mainly be teaching philosophy to uh, adolescents uh, or at least young, younger men. Um, And philosophy has always been associated historically uh, with the the education of the youth because uh, the belief was that it was mainly about teaching people strength of character. And so it made sense to address that to people at the beginning uh, of their life, uh, beginning of adulthood anyway. Um, But not so much these days. Um, And uh, if we taught stoicism, we taught philosophy in schools, I think it would be a good idea. I think it would be a radical idea. I think you'd encounter the same problem that people have encountered for the past two and a half thousand years, which is very simply, if you encourage young people to think too deeply about uh, life, the universe, politics, society, and everything inevitably upsets the status quo because shock horror they'll start to question the stuff that their parents taught them. And uh, I think you'd find historically that tends to upset the apple cart and people get quite uh, defensive about it. They think, what are these kids doing? They're questioning everything. We can't have that. <laughs> like, you know, simple observation, but that's how things tend to depend. That's why Socrates was executed. They said that he corrupted the youth. Well, he corrupted the youth by teaching them to ask lots of questions. Like People didn't like that. They don't, uh, they don't like it, Jody. sometimes when you ask too many questions, like it upsets the apple cart, especially if you ask uh, difficult questions to important people, which is what Socrates loved to do, and it got him in a lot of trouble. Um, so it, would, it rocks the boat. It's subversive if you get uh, people to think very deeply. But it also, I think, would potentially make people stronger, more independent, more emotionally resilient. Um, this is the paradox. Like it's uh, arguably throughout history, people have said there are things that you could do to make people stronger as individuals, but it makes it harder to control them. Like, so what does society really want to do? Does it really want people to flourish? Does it want to make them stronger and more independent? Uh, or you know, would it rather just kind of uh, exert a little bit more influence and a little bit more control over? Uh, it's always tempting to teach people in a more dogmatic kind of didactic style if you have a preconceived idea about what you want them to to think as they grow older um so that this is a problem like it would we'd have people questioning everything um i think it'd be a good thing but a lot of people would see that as quite scary i think but uh, we if we can train people if we could teach people about stoicism i think we'd make them more emotionally resilient and less prone to mental health problems in adulthood. So in, that's what we mean by resilience, incidentally, in psychology. The term resilience has a kind of technical meaning, and it, it, it means the ability to bounce back from trauma or setback. But generally in psychology, we use it to refer to pre- stress prevention, to training people in psychological skills in advance that would prepare them for coping with future adversity so that they would be at lower risk of developing mental health problems. And so there's a lot of interest in training vulnerable communities in resilience skills 
like people entering the military. Um, I, I work a bit with the military. We're doing a military conference next year. So there's a lot of interest in training new recruits and resilience skills. So they're less likely to experience trauma. Um, people who have stressful jobs like carers uh, are sometimes trained in resilience, like so that they're potentially more robust emotionally and less uh, affected by adversity. And uh, school children are sometimes trained in resilience and uh, in certain research projects in order to reduce the risk of them developing mental health problems in the future. Because as everybody knows, Jodie, prevention is better than cure. And so oh, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Mental health would be the, the holy grail of mental health if we could make people more, uh, more robust, less emotionally vulnerable, um, less vulnerable to mental health problems, I mean. And uh, stoicism is this, uh, holds a lot of promise in that regard for reasons that might not be obvious at first. So like CBT is used for resilience training, but one of the problems we find is that if you train people, and there's been research in this area, and what we find is, it, does it work? Yes and no. So you can train people to become more resilient, but they tend to stop using the skills after like a year or two. And so you have to keep doing refresher courses. And so the, the search is on for a type of emotional resilience training that would be sticky, as psychologists sometimes say, that would be permanent, um, that you wouldn't have to keep doing top-ups of. And so the, the appeal of stoicism is that people think stoicism might be sticky, that stoicism might be uh, a bunch of skills and a philosophy of life that makes people more robust, but that is also kind of permanent or long lasting. People, so stoicism is for life, it's not just for Christmas kind of thing. If you teach people stoicism, maybe they'll continue to, to think about it forever. Right? And uh, one indication of that is I've never met anyone yet, I don't know if you have, probably not, but I haven't met anyone uh, who has a, a quote from a CBT book tattooed on them for instance no um, definitely not or, but i'll let you know albert if i do ellis. yeah if you ever meet an albert ellis and rnt beck are the two founders of cbt i've never seen anyone that had an albert ellis or an rnt beck tattoo right but i've met a surprising number of people that have marcus aurelius tattoos or that have quotes from seneca or marcus aurelius tattooed on their body and that's just a kind of kind of passing you know i mentioned that just as an example of the fact that people identify with stoicism at a much deeper level. And so it becomes not just a bunch of techniques to them, but it becomes part of their philosophy of life. It becomes part of their very identity. Um, and so it stays with them for longer. It's, stoicism is sticky uh, for that reason. And also because the, we have less than 1% of the stoic literature surviving today. Uh, most of it is gone, but we kind of, for that reason, have the creme de la creme. We, we have curated by history, uh, arguably some of the best stoic writings survived two and a half thousand years, almost. Um, and so the quality of writing is exceptional. Um, it would be like if Shakespeare had written a self-help book to read Seneca as one of the finest writers of antiquity, for example. And that's not true of most modern self-help books. I mean, some of them are quite good, but people don't read books on CBT and then remember quotes from them three, four decades later, usually. But people read Marcus Aurelius and decades later, they'll still remember some of the passages because they're memorable, because they're beautifully written. Um, and they've survived for a long time because they're, like, they have this appeal. And so that's part of the stickiness of Stoicism as well. The beauty uh, of the, the writing of the classics themselves is, is important. It's memorable to people. People engage with it emotionally in a way that they don't so easily uh, find with, uh, with modern self-help or, or psychotherapy literature. So if we taught it to kids in schools, I think there's a possibility, there are pros and cons to doing it, but one possibility is that we might give them skills that are consistent with cognitive therapy that would be healthy for them, but that might actually be lifelong. And that would be what I'd like to call the holy grail 
of modern mental health research. That would be incredible um, to raise our youth and our kids in a way that they build strong emotional resilience that they can tackle whatever happens. Uh, obviously, the future is unknown. No one knows what's going to happen. But obviously, with AI, robotics, technology, everything is going so fast, it would be incredible for our youth to be able to handle it in a way that it doesn't affect their mental health. But it would turn society upside down because uh, the whole point of Stoicism, going all the way back to Socrates and down through the Stoics, the Stoics talked about what they, uh, they did as uh, an epistropha, like, a, like a doing a U-turn, a conversion. Um, so they said, we, you have to completely turn the values of society upside down. So when you come into the world, you look around, everybody seems to be trying to accumulate wealth and build their reputation, right? impress other people. People like you look around, you're a small kid, you're born, you think, I don't know what life is about. What is everyone else doing? Oh, they're all trying to impress each other and accumulate as much wealth and property. Maybe that's what the meaning of life is, right? To put it glibly. Like, so as we grow up, we, that's all we see. Um, and the Stoics fundamentally want to, to tell us that that's crazy and that uh, none of these things lead to true happiness. And that what we should be pursuing is enlightenment and moral wisdom and strength of character and that reputation and, and wealth are trivial by comparison. Um, but if we taught a generation of kids that, uh, you know, that wealth and property and reputation and status aren't the be all and end all, that would, uh, that would change things, you know, like we'd be encouraging them to radically question consumerism and celebrity culture and stuff like that. Like everybody knows those things are all BS anyway, right? But we, if we actually got <laughs> kids like, to see through that, why like, we think that'd be great, like, because it is all, it's an illusion, right? Celebrity culture is nonsense. Like consumerism is nonsense. Everyone knows that. We all know that. Um, but we still kind of all buy into it and go around acting as if that's what life is about. And, and then our kids copy us. And so it goes on generation after generation after generation. But Socrates and the Stoics thought we should teach kids to see through this like, and to, to realize that true happiness comes from within. But in doing that, we turn society's values on their head. Um, so that's why they made Socrates drink hemlock. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Okay, so it's, we... It's too radical. <laughs> oh, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you today. And I really appreciate your wisdom and knowledge. And I'm sure who's, whoever is listening to this interview has gained massive insight around stoicism and how implementing the philosophy of it into your daily life can truly create virtue happiness and everlasting change. I have one last question for you. If you could change one thing in the world, what would it be? Oh, gosh, there's so many things to choose from, Jodie. <laughs> Just I, one thing. <laughs> <laughs> what would I, if I could change what? Um, I'm only allowed one thing. Um, I, I'll tell you a really specific thing and it's not actually a big philosophical thing it's uh it's more of a it's more of a specific little pet project that i have because i'm in athens at the moment not a lot of people know this but the first university the first academic institution in the world was plato's academy and for many centuries it was the most famous seat of learning in the whole of the western world um, and uh, it, the ruins of it still exist, but they're in a park that's full of graffiti and garbage and drug addicts and stuff. It's uh, they're called the Academy Park in Athens. And so I would uh, restore the, uh, if I could change one thing in the world, I'd, I'd restore Plato's Academy and, uh, you know, improve the area surrounding it. Uh, have a, a international conference center built there so that you could say, people could say, Jody, what are you doing uh, next? What are you doing uh, for your holidays? And you could say, well, I'm going to jump on a plane. I'm going to fly to Greece. I'm going to go to a conference at Plato's Academy. 
Like, because yeah. I think that'd be really cool. Like, but at the moment, it's a wasteland. You know, this is the seat of learning, uh, the, the 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 kind of cornerstone of, of uh, Western civilization, in a sense. And it, it's uh, it's a rundown park. Like, but I'd, if I could change something specific, I'd like to see uh, Plato's yeah. Academy restored. But anything is possible, and um, it sounds like, yeah, I mean, how amazing. Yeah, I'd love to jump on a plane and come to Greece and go to a conference about stoicism. Um, yeah, never never give up. If you've got a dream and something that you're really passionate about, I say try and make it happen, Donald. You just never mm. know what's – you never know. There are people uh, that will help Jody. you. <laughs> if there are billion, if there's any billionaire philanthropists watching your podcast, exactly, <laughs> yeah, just drop me a line, and uh, you know, we can we could source it. We could, we could be on that tomorrow. Oh, that's beautiful. We'll start laying the foundations tomorrow. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the Zoom interview series, and I hope whoever's listening has really gained massive awareness around Stoicism, and I will be posting up uh, the link uh, for your book and your website and, and any other information that you want to give me. But thank you so much for having us, having you on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, have a great week and keep inspiring us with your incredible uh, writing about Stoicism. Thank you very much. I will do. I'll do my best. <laughs> Bye for now.